Welcome to the Proceedings Podcast. I'm Bill Hamlet, the Editor-in-Chief of Proceedings at the U.S. Naval Institute. Today is Tuesday, October 7th, 17th, sorry, 2023. Good to have you on board as always, everyone. Today's show is brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. I can't help myself from smiling right now. That's because I have Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental. I pay no deductible for in-network services. My in-network preventive care is fully covered, including three cleanings a year. Learn more at bcpsfepdental.com. Okay, before I get to my guest today, I'd like to highlight a couple things happening here at the Naval Institute. First, a week ago last night, we celebrated our 150th anniversary uh, in great style at the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center. It was great to see several hundred members, donors, friends, authors, trustees, board members, midshipmen, staff members. Thanks to all who attended. It was a great event ending with spectacular fireworks. I'm told one of the first times that we've ever actually had fireworks here uh, at the Naval Academy on the yard. So it was, uh, it was a big event. Uh, second, in honor of our 150th anniversary, we have a special membership discount this month. So if you are not a member or if you'd like to renew or give a gift membership uh, to one of your shipmates or colleagues or family members, you can renew now or, or join now and get $15 off our annual membership. Uh, so go to usni.org forward slash join to become a member or give a gift membership. And third is uh, next Wednesday, 25 October, here on the Naval Academy grounds, our annual history conference or applied history conference that the Naval Institute and the Naval Academy co-sponsor will be doing it in the Jack C. Taylor Conference Center here at the Naval Institute. It is titled Critical Thinking, Our Greatest Weapon to Winning Tomorrow's War. Speakers and panelists will include former SecDef James Mattis, former Deputy Secretary of Defense Bob Work, the former CEO and Chairman of Google Eric Schmidt, and noted authors Peter Singer and Trent Hone. You can attend in person or virtually. Uh, to register, go to usni.org forward slash events, and you'll be able to find that link, click on it, and uh, and sign up. Okay, so on to my guests. My guests today are two of the first 100 women submariners in the U.S. Navy, Lieutenant Commander Emma McCarthy and Lieutenant Commander Andrea Howard. Emma's joining us from uh, Alexandria, Virginia, where she is stationed at the Pentagon, and Andrea Howard is uh, joining us from the Norfolk area, where she is on sea duty on uh, a submarine, the USS New Jersey, one of the newest uh, SSNs in our force. Um, and they joined forces in the October issue of Proceedings on an article titled Different But Equal. It's an article full of lessons from the process of integrating women on submarines. Emma, Andrea, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thanks, Bill. Really appreciate it. As okay. always. I was just going to say, as always, it's a treat for me to hop in with the Naval Institute. So thank you for having me back. Yeah. And let me mention that uh, Andrea is a member of our editorial board. So great to have her here uh, uh, and with us every month when we discuss uh, proceedings articles, what we're going to publish, how we're going to publish things. Um, so for our listeners who aren't um, familiar with your backgrounds, I'll go Emma first and then Andrea. Just tell us a little bit about your career so far as submarine officers uh, and your educational backgrounds. Yeah, um, for uh, this is Emma. And then for my education, I went to the United States Naval Academy and I graduated in 2011. Um, and I was in the second cohort of women selected to go submarines. Um, and after I graduated in the spring of 2011, I started the junior officer pipeline. Um, and I arrived in my first submarine, the USS Georgia in early uh, 2013. Um, after my junior officer tour, I was selected for um, the Navy's Fleet Scholar Education Program, and I was able to use that scholarship to go to Harvard Business School um, for my shore tour, which was um, a really sweet gig. And then following that shore tour, um, I st started my department head tour, which was on uh, USS Ohio Blue as the engineer officer. Um, and as mentioned, um, my current assignment is working as a flag aide to the chief of naval operations. Awesome. Thanks, Emma. Mm -hmm. Andrea. Yeah, yeah I'll, I'll go ahead and start where Emma and I crossed paths. So we overlapped on USS Ohio, which was my first sea duty. 
Emma was my engineer and I spent a lot of time in engineering department, first as a new division officer and then as the assistant engineer for the latter portion of my tour. And I, with the encouragement of Emma, went directly to department head. So I gave up my shortity for the opportunity to sync back up with my year group after a bit of graduate education, which I'll talk about. But I am now on my second boat as the navigator on USS New Jersey. And we are slated to go out for sea trials here in just a couple of weeks, if all goes according to plan. Uh, but my Navy journey, like Emma's, also kicked off at the Naval Academy. I was class of 2015, and upon commissioning, was granted the opportunity to do two years of graduate education in the United Kingdom, one year at King's College London, where I earned a Master in Science and Security, then the second at the University of Oxford, where I earned a Master's in Global Governance and Diplomacy, before then kicking off my time with the, with the, the good books, you know, and, and Rick over culture in the submarine community. So it's been a great journey and it's this is kind of a nice opportunity to, you know, go full circle and reflect on times that we shared, you know, in the fleet and some of our experiences from the Naval Academy that led us to this point. Uh, it's great to have you guys collaborating on this uh, on this uh, article. Uh, so let's start with a little history and I'll go to Emma first because you're a senior here and you mentioned you were in the second cohort of women submariners. Uh, so when did the submarine force start to allow women? What was the decision that 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 uh, sort of broke the dam open there? And how many submarines in the fleet today and what types have integrated crews? Yeah. Um, so the announcement that women were going to be elected or uh, able to go submarines happened in the spring of 2010. There was um, some indication that it was in the work. So um, the Naval Academy was tracking it as an option. But in the spring of 2010 is when it was um, approved and um, several women who were in the first cohort were approved um, for nuclear surface warfare. And then they elected to shift over to um, the submarine option uh, when it was finally approved. Um, so that graduating class would have been in the spring of 2010. Uh, with the first cohort reaching the submarines um, after the training pipeline in 2011. Um, for myself, I was the second cohort, um, and I, I was reaching my submarine at the very beginning of 2013. Um, at that time, though, um, they were still integrating several crews uh, on the Ohio classes for SSGNs and SSBNs. So my crew um, on USS Georgia, the blue crew, I was the first junior officer to show up for that crew. And then the gold crew had had women from the first cohort. Um, um, so I was able to learn from them a bit um, and go underway with them at one point um, to uh, work, with, work with them and learn how they had started their integration process and some of the lessons learned that they had from their first underway periods. Um, for, and, and, yeah. Oh yeah, go ahead. No, no, I was just gonna say, which classes of ships or uh, of submarines now have women? Yeah, so all submarines, all classes of ships have at least one woman uh, serving on them. Some of them are just at the EXO department head level, um, mm -hmm. while the SSBNs, SSGNs, and Virginia classes um, have uh, junior officers, department heads, and uh, several of them enlisted as well, with Andrea's crew being one of the first ones to have uh, enlisted women on a Virginia class. Um, for the current numbers, there's uh, 14 integ integrated crews right now across the SSBN, SSGN, and fast attack classes. And, and that the 14 includes blue and gold crew on the SSBNs and GNs? It does include the blue and gold crew. So that's they count it as 14 crews. Got it. Got it. It sounds yeah. like the, the on the SSN side, the fast attack, the Virginia class are being... Uh, integrated, whereas the older uh, Los Angeles class, uh, maybe not so, as you mentioned, you know, EXO department heads, but but not a full uh, integrated crew. Is that, Am I reading that right? That is correct. Um, the decision has been made for um, executive officers to be able to serve on any platform. Um, and that's how you can get those one of one situations on the Los Angeles classes but they will not be refitted for fully integrated crews to include the enlisted women. Um, those will be moving forward with the Virginia classes. 
Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, Andrea, the article starts off by you, you, you uh, recount showing up to our first submarines as JOs. We wielded the same technical knowledge and preparation as our male peers. So for our non-submariner audience, what did the training pipeline entail? And when did you show up to your first boat? Yeah, I'm going to defer that question and just give a little more context for the integration of junior enlisted women really quickly. Okay. So New Jersey is the first Virginia class that has been from the keeling outfitted with the birthing module for the junior enlisted women, which really just consists of hard panel doors, vice curtains in forward compartment upper level and down in, fo in forward compartment lower level. So it gives a little bit more privacy and modularity to the birthings. And then the heads additionally also have a little bit more of a, a, a division in what's called skinny man and forward compartment upper level. So again, it allows more modularity by both in, in terms of the space where women are sleeping and then the head usage. So that, that's why those new Virginia classes from New Jersey onwards will be integrated from you know Got 796 and, until the rest of, of the production line for, for that class. Um, regarding the training pipeline though, it's a three prong process that ultimately gets the nuclear trained officers to the fleet. The first is the Naval Nuclear Power Training Command down in Charleston, South Carolina, which consists of six months of classroom training focused on the broad array of, of topics required to safely operate the propulsion plant, be it radiological controls to electrical engineering. The second part of the training then consists of hands-on work with the nuclear reactors in a, a safe environment. So we utilize what's called moored training ships, which are converted submarines that have additional safety and shutdown features for the reactors. And students there get the chance to stand watch as they would on an underway submarine. So for the officers, it's engineering officer watch qualifications as the ultimate goal. And for the enlisted sailors, it's in keeping with their rates, whether that's mechanics or electricians or, again, the radiological control folks. After that training is completed, and sometimes the order gets a little bit shifted around based on class availability and the, the rate at which students are going through that prototype unit. There's a third piece called the submarine officer basic course which is a two month stint up in Groton in the schoolhouse, wherein the students are trained in the basics of contact management and for the first time get to read the sonar screens. And I, I like to describe it as almost learning the, the basics of the matrix. So getting to read the green energy on the screens and turn that into realistic pictures of what that looks like on the surface and below the surface. The basics of the matrix, I like it, mm -hmm. I like it. All right. Uh, so, Emma, um, in the article, you you uh, write that the, the crew, as you were arriving, both of you were arriving at your first cruise, were keenly aware of the F for female in your personnel records. So there was a little more excitement or interest in your arrival to the boat. And there was a bit of a fishbowl effect. Describe that for us. Um, yeah. So to start with, as I mentioned, I was the first junior officer on my crew. Um, and before women showed up to the first cruise going through integration, there was an extensive amount of training, almost a year of various um, Navy provided trainings on how integration would work for the mechanics of birthing, how to conduct yourselves. Um, kind of rules and regulations and reminders of um, it, it, what it actually meant in trying to emphasize that certain things weren't going to change. But at the same time, um, there, there were going to be changes to be made. Uh, you know, part of the traditional junior officer experience is living um, in, a, in a large birthing situation, some, um, sometimes mixed in with the enlisted if um, that's not possible. Um, but as a a young uh, woman junior officer going joining the crew, we were going to be in state rooms right away. So there's that one rite of passage that you're not going to have um, that some people may take on negatively. Um, in a in a positive way, though, I'll say, you know, I was assigned my sea dad, my mentor within the wardroom, who volunteered to be my sea dad, a fellow Naval Academy graduate um, from the year before. So he knew some of the women already um, in the submarine force um, and uh, volunteered to be my sea dad. But um, going back through the engine room the first time, uh, you know, lots of people congregating in certain areas. Um, to talk about their part of the engine room that they owned. As soon as word kind of got out that I was there and uh, we were walking through the engine room, there was uh, people um, showing up 
throughout the engine room on a shutdown plant that normally wouldn't be there just to talk about it. And they were just excited. Um, and were, even were you, by, the, yeah, Emma, were you the, the first woman on your boat? On my crew, yes. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, crew. The other crew had junior um, enlisted women, but they were not down at the ship that day. They didn't own the boat at the time. And so I was um, the first one they were really going to be working with. Um, wow. And uh, I remember the like first opportunity came up that a, a practical factor could be done. And you hear all these whisperings, oh, we're about to go do this. We should see if uh, the new junior officer is ready to do it. And sure thing, I'm getting dragged into maneuvering, uh, performing practical factors on a plant that I knew nothing about. Um, and, you know, it, maneuvering is a very small space and it was filled to the max to make sure one, the evolution went correctly, but two, I think there's a few people that were just interested in being able to say that they were there when I was doing my first practical factors. Um, I even, you know, the people who were, um, excited about the integration or at least felt uh, benevolently about it. Um, it. As I was in the wardroom or in officer study, uh, people coming by and introducing themselves and vocalizing that they were excited for the first uh, woman junior officer to be there. Um, I will say in those first few weeks, no one made it blatantly obvious that they didn't want me to be there. But, you know, uh, a little bit later on, I would come against some other other churn um, from that point on. Um, I, I also just want to say it wasn't exactly different when I showed up as the first woman engineer on an Ohio class as well. Um, Ohio was in a, a large maintenance period at the time. I was the only woman member of the um, JTE, the joint testing uh, group. And, um, you know, being the youngest person and the only woman on that on that group, um, it was obvious to me that I was a little bit different than everyone else. But at the same time, after I've proven myself technically competent, um, other members of that group started bringing their their junior women, their junior women engineers, their junior um, uh, team members that were women to the meetings that I was at. And I, I know it wasn't a coincidence. Um, they wanted themselves to see themselves in a leadership position um, farther yeah. down that road that could be part of that decision making group. Very cool. Uh, mm -hmm. For your your second submarine tours, you both served or and Andrea, you're now serving as department heads during that initial integration of enlisted women. Uh, and you write that the crew reactions have ranged from treating women the same to making the experience awkward to disinterest to, in some cases, actively subverting them. Uh, Andrea, could you give a, a positive and a negative example of that uh, integration process? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's really easy to bend the positive and negative examples into two themes. And it's those that draw attention to the differences between the men and women sailors and those that really foster a, a culture wherein we're submariners first and there are you know, auxiliary concerns just based on the, the nature of us being women or being men. So from the, the negative side, you know, there was definitely some awkwardness on Ohio that Emma was alluding to. You know, there was training that preceded the arrival of the junior enlisted women that drove, uh, like maybe it, it, the best way to describe it is kind of extreme caution around their arrival and people mm -hmm. being very um, aware of the spaces that they were in with these women. And it created sort of this notion that perhaps there would be a separate chain of command or separate considerations for these sailors and their day-to-day -day operations on board. When the women actually arrived, there there was, again, some awkwardness around qualifications. I had the, the pleasure of going through qualifications in the engineering department as the first women on the enlisted side were doing the, the same types of interviews and checkouts with sailors in that department. And we had to, as, as the officers, advocate for them in situations where it felt like their checkouts might not have been of equal rigor to those of their male counterparts because they were getting sort of this fishbowl effect and you know maybe a different standard than the men in those scenarios. And so we, we worked to squash that as a crew and we were effective in doing so. But it, it did show that I think some of that training you know, ingrained within folks that there maybe was a need for different treatment. Down the road, too, after their arrival, 
I, th I think there were also instances in which as folks got more comfortable that there could have been a perception of favoritism of certain women amongst different chiefs. And that didn't always fall along the lines of normal relationships that you might see between you know, men on men and men mentors and, and those types of chains. So, you know, we, we definitely were, were churning and evolving in Ohio in the way that these women showed up on board, but very much so their, their differences were highlighted before they actually got on board. And I think it took, frankly, years of work to undo some of that and make it more of a, of a non-issue and more of just a, an auxiliary component of having that diverse crew. On New Jersey, conversely, it took some of that experience from Ohio and we did in many ways the opposite thing. So there was no all hands training prior to the arrival of the enlisted women on board. We did a little bit of behind the scenes work with the chief of the boat and me to work with the chief's quarters and drive home that there would not be a separate chain of command, that the chiefs in particular would be responsible for fielding questions that any of the sailors had about the arrival of the women and would reiterate that there was no change in standards, that we would continue to treat people with the two most important factors on board, which are dignity and respect. I think, again, a positive example of how that translated was that there was a, a decency issue and, and something that one of the, the women sailors was wearing on in transit from to and from work. And her chief initially sought out a woman divo to go address that sailor and correct that issue. And I that that junior officer thankfully came to me and I told her that she should take her chief and they should go talk to the cob first for some guidance on how to address that. And the cob very pointedly said that the chief would definitely not have come to the cob with that issue issue if it had been a similar type of issue with a male sailor. And therefore it was the chief's responsibility and not the junior officers to correct that issue. And the chief ultimately ended up doing so. So again, by emphasizing that, you know, the women mentors who are assigned to be on the boat legally should be there to pr provide resources and informal counseling to folks that want to leverage that normal chain of command for new situations. But ultimately, the responsibility to interact with women sailors falls to the normal chain of command. And so that's where I think we, we got it right on New Jersey. And Ohio definitely came to that conclusion through, you know, years of, of adapting and, and improving that process. Gotcha. Uh, the article talks about three different parts or three, you know, a three part formula to achieve the desired end state. Uh, so, Emma, what are those three parts and, and could you describe the first one? Yeah, and uh, you know, this is not the end all be all of recommendations. There's a laundry it's list not. of other ones, but um, <laughs> you know, just to make it uh, easily formatted, the, the first part of the three parts being uh, lead and mentor, the second one creating an inclusive space and course correcting for biases. And then the third one is staying conscious of language and standards. Um, and, and I definitely put emphasis on the first one for lead and mentor. Um, and that is something I experienced uh, myself, as well as, um, you know, concerns from my peers on what right looks like for mentoring uh, junior officers that are going to be a, a different gender than themselves. Um, and leading and mentoring is the only way that uh, the submarine force sees and achieves success and is able to train the next generation of warfighters and technicians and um, changing that formula for success based on gender is not um, going to be conducive to having a ready submarine fleet. And that is what it's all about. And, you know, sitting in a room of my peers and hearing one of my peers say that they would not mentor female junior officers um, because they didn't want to take on any risk that could be associated with being in a small space with a woman on a submarine. Um, it was really eye opening to hear one of my peers uh, speak like that. But also, um, it brought me to the conclusion that I needed to be more active um, in this system and make sure people understand that there is a way to lead and mentor um, everyone who is coming to your crew, regardless of uh, their gender. And um, having those conversations are really important. Um, but in my own context, I, I saw several different reactions from my department heads, my exos, my commanding officers 
on how they were going to either treat um, the women that were coming on board, um, how they were going to conduct mentorship and, and lead them in their training on becoming a warfighter. And uh, from all that, it became apparent to me that we needed to make sure that we were talking about this and talking about, hey, wardroom training is for everyone or nuclear power training is for everyone and everyone can sit in that classroom. And when it's time for a sailor or junior officer to sit their boards, their technical competency is what's being judged at that moment. And they should have been given every opportunity to s succeed to get to that point. And um, their path should not be hindered or benefited from their gender being different. Um, and, and that's something that you know I, I felt pretty passionately about, both as uh, one of the first like junior officers coming to my crew and um you know seeing it again um as we are integrating enlisted women and you know anyone who has like concerns about um mentoring or leading someone of a different gender on a submarine um you know take some time to think about it discuss options with a peer or a, a senior individual or someone who looks a little bit different than you and come up for a recipe for success and everyone's leadership style is different and that's okay. But once you come up with that recipe for success, make sure it's fair and equal for everyone that you're going to be doing um, who you are responsible for training and making sure they're set up for success because there are there are tight spaces. And, you know, in the in the sonar shack, you will be sitting next to someone for eight hours, um, regardless of who they are. And so figure out a way to be comfortable with those people next to you and figure out a way to properly train them so they can stand sonar supervisor one day. Let me just pull on that a little bit more because uh, you mm -hmm. mentioned, you know, the 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 unease of one of your fellow JOs with the the thought of one-on-one -on -one counseling with a, a, mm -hmm. another, you know, officer or an enlisted person, you know, man to woman, right? That's a there's a power dynamic or or woman to man, you know, superior to to uh, to junior person, and and doing that in a closed space, you know, you don't want to, you know, if, if you've got some tough feedback to provide to somebody, you don't want to do it you know, in front of the wardroom, right. Or in front of mm -hmm. the, you know, everybody in, in main control. Uh, so what, what were there some best practices that you could recommend of like, Hey, you just have to, you know, uh, be a, be a division officer, be a department head and do it right. You know, find a place to, to, uh, to have that private conversation. What, what were, did that, did that fellow JO kind of come around and learn that? What, you know, what, what did you see in terms of best practices? Um, yeah, I, I think like uh, an easy way to start is if it isn't like a one on one conversation, then making sure there's another junior officer or another peer in the room so that you do have a third party person who can be there both for the hard conversation and the power dynamic problems that um, you may be concerned about. Um, the other part of it is like, hey, just because this conversation maybe normally would have happened, you know, in a in a stateroom that's too small of a space that you want it to happen in, you know, maybe find a quiet spot in the engine room. If you're on an SSGN, SSBN, there's a space between the wardroom and the officer study to have a private conversation. Um, you know, I've even made made um, space up in the, the sonar equipment space. Um, just to shut that door and have the conversation with the individual you need to have it with. And you're not necessarily worried about being in someone's personal space bubble while you're having that private conversation. And it might be a little unconventional or where maybe it would not have happened without, um, you know, that consciousness of gender, um, but it can still happen on a submarine. And then if the submarine's in port, you know, there's plenty of places that you can go off ship and, you know, have a frank and honest conversation. And maybe a setting like that is actually better um, because it removes the stresses of whatever the boat's dealing with at the time. Gotcha. Okay. No, that's <laughs> good advice. Um, so when you mentioned, uh, you know, inclusive space, right? I can almost hear some of our older retired or, and I, and I represent that group uh, listeners groan when they hear that, you know, inclusive um, mm -hmm. you know, back, back in my day. Well, frankly, you know, Bill Hamlet, 2023, I don't care. There's a job to do. 
There, there are differences between men and women. Your article uh, gets to some of those things. Andrea, could you talk about, because you, you bring it out in a couple of paragraphs that I just thought were really well done. Uh, the role of the independent duty corpsman, uh, the heads and beds issues, and, and birthing inspections. Definitely. Yeah, the independent duty corpsman, the IDC or DOC, as we colloquially call them, um, are integral to the warfighting readiness of the crew. So, you know, we, we've talked a lot about the differences between men and women, and we have to address those differences to drive towards a culture of unity on the crews that ultimately gets you to warfighting readiness. That's what this is about, is building a, a sustained culture of submariners who are ready to go take on the next conflict. And part of that is the reality that the doc needs to care for the the specifics of being a woman underway on a submarine for months at a time. So part of it is just the strict medical needs of understanding that women have reproductive health care needs and other needs just pertaining to the physical structure of our bodies. And beyond that, though, it is about having that open rapport of the doc with those women so that they feel free to not just leverage resources regarding their physical health, but also their mental health. You know, the docs are the folks that hold the keys to those resources, too. So it's about making sure that people are in their best physical and mental state to fight the nation's wars when the time comes and to be in a fit state to bring up any concerns when they're on watch and to help support the folks that are on, on watch, even when they're off watch. You know, the, on, on the second piece regarding heads and beds and birthing inspections, um, you know, the cardinal sin on the, on the submarine is having empty racks. And so we're building a, a culture within the submarine community where we're having iterative conversations, not based on a, a panacea type solution for all crews with all types of women and all types of individuals, but wherein you can have conversations with your chain of command and discuss the individual comfort levels of the crew members involved to do things like mixed birthing. There have been instances where department head and junior officer shore duty riders have lived in staterooms or have lived in, we have three packs or five packs as we call them with those number of racks on Virginia classes. And, and folks have lived in those settings now for weeks at a time in a mixed gender environment and have had no issue based on the seniority of the individuals involved and the open dis discourse about any discomfort with the chain of command. For the heads, it's a little bit easier on Ohio class because there's just by strict numbers more heads available in terms of toilets and showers for the officers and the enlisted. On a Virginia class, the officer wardroom head has one toilet and one shower. And so, again, you, you have to have open discourse amongst the members of the wardroom who are using that head to either make it women or male exclusive times, wherein you can kind of lock the door and, and have free reign of the toilet and the shower. But most crews are moving more towards a model where you put up a curtain to separate the shower portion and the toilet portion. So that way you can have people of other genders utilizing those resources simultaneously. And it becomes important if you're in the middle of your watch and you have your midway relief and you need to go use the toilet. And, you know, in my instance, there's only a certain number of toilets that I can use on, particularly in a Virginia class where there aren't junior enlisted women. So it's, it's useful for me to be able to go in and use the toilet while there is a man showering with no concern. Again, as long as the, the folks that are involved understand the, the expectations and, and cultural decency surrounding that. And that's typically what you're seeing in the case of these crews. But it, like I said, it requires that iterative, iterative dis discourse as more people are showing up to the crew to make sure that folks are comfortable. And maybe you do a combination of, of men and women times or male only and female only times. And that's and that's all, all good. But like I said, it's, it's really just to make sure that people are in the best physical state possible, both in the relationship with the IDC and in terms of the heads and beds usage so that you can have a crew that is fit for war. And that's what this is all about is in a, in a community that is struggling to retain people to bring the best talent in and then make folks comfortable and healthy so they can continue on in this profession. I'm hearing communication, coordination and maturity. Uh, without those three things, this is going to be really hard to make it work well, right? Um, so, Emma, the third leg of the stool or the formula that you uh, have, uh, that you both have put forward here is stay conscious of language and standards. Uh, so talk a bit about why language is important. And, and I violated one of your rules, by the way, at the top of the show. And so I'll put myself on the court. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so uh, language is something that people are sensitive to because 
they hear words that they identify with or they don't identify with. And that starts to draw a circle of who is in the norm and who is outside of that collective. And as a leader, you want to make sure that your language is including all of your crew. And some, and some people are going to be more comfortable with a spectrum than others. And it's okay to have those conversations um, as a wardroom, as a chief's quarters, as a first class petty officers association for what is appropriate for addressing certain groups. Um, you know, my standard is that like officers and sailors uh, apply to everyone who's who's in the group officer chiefs and sailors. Right. Um, or just referring to your people as your crew members and your teammates. Um, you know, if you want to use gender identifying language, then do you need to include both gender titles or multiple gender titles? Um, not necessarily. However, um, if you're always only referring to one group, then um, that will be noticed by the people that you are leading. And um, I think the younger generation is frankly better at it than um, the generations that are in leadership roles. Um, part of that is it's the younger generations or the, the department head level generations job to bridge that gap on where uh, the younger generations, both junior officers and junior enlisted, how they identify what kind of language they want to be addressed with, as well as, you know, what the commanding officer, the COB, um, other heads of the chief quarters thinks is the right answer. And, you know, maybe there is something in the middle we don't necessarily need to be using common civilian language. Maybe we should just be using our military language because we all volunteered to be part of the submarine force um, and just figuring out what's appropriate or what how you what you want to be conveying. Um, I also just say like standards in general, because a lot of uniform standards are changing. And as Andrea hinted on beforehand, um, it's part of every person in the chain of command to be responsible for enforcing the standards um, for the people below them. Um, does the commanding officer need to be enforcing it with junior enlisted? No, that's not the commanding officer's job. That's the chief's quarters job. But as a department head, you know, it, it's a uh, department head's job to set up the junior officers for success, too. Um, as, um, Andrea's example earlier hits on that perfectly. And I just wanted to mention real quick, you know, this, the submarine force is a war fighting, war training uh, organization. And the submarine force has that pretty well locked down. So what we're talking about here is the added 1% that's going to make us 1% better, 1% more competitive, 1% more of um, a team that is ready to execute that war fighting mission. It's this should not be taking up, you know, the 50% of a crew's time. But if the crew spends 1% of their day working on this stuff and making themselves a little bit better, that's going to make them more ready to execute uh, when the day comes that need, they need to launch that missile or launch that torpedo. And um, that's where we, we are at as a fleet and a submarine force is every inch matters, every percent mat matters, and we should be spending time on having these conversations so that we can get ourselves um, to that cutting edge every single day. Yeah, I, uh, I'm, I'm mindful of time here. We're running towards mm -hmm. the end, but um, I wanted to get to two things that weren't specific to your article, uh, but there are certainly topics that are being discussed about the Navy and about the submarine force, uh, particularly you mentioned, Emma, uh, retention. You know, the submarine force is, is struggling with retention. And then uh, in, in previous articles, Andrea uh, and you, Emma, have, have written about submarine maintenance and, uh, you know, the, the, the challenges of getting submarines into and out of the maintenance availabilities on time. Just curious from your perspectives, how's it going out there? Um, I will turn this over to Andrea for maintenance portion, since she's kind of living the the, the well, baby she, submarine lifestyle right now. Yeah, you're in the bringing yards. the boat yeah. to life, right? Yeah. yeah. We are bringing the boat to life out of Newport News Shipbuilding. I can wrap up the sentiment about retention and submarine maintenance and really the ethos of this article 
all in, in one statement, and Emma hit the sentiment on the head, is that we are submariners first. And as a community, we are trying to figure out how to be submariners and women, submariners and folks that are retaining people who don't look like us in the community, submariners and, and crews that are delivering new ships on time and completing maintenance availabilities on time. So from the deck plate, these conversations that we're having are incredibly important because in the absence of making people feel included and fulfilled, they are going to get out of this force and we are going to have less warfighters and less retention of knowledge that we need to deliver new construction units out of an incredibly niche set of skills in order to, to pass on those follow on lesson learned so that you don't end up in a situation every time we're delivering a Virginia class ship like we have with New Jersey, where we're now about almost three years behind schedule. So for the curmudgeons who might, you know, be, be asking why Emma and I are being those women and talking about these types of issues from the deck plate, I can absolutely attest to the fact that the young men and women and other folks who are showing up to my crew want to have these types of conversations so that they feel feel fulfilled on a day-to-day -day basis and are encouraged and inspired to be the folks that are staying in to combat the retention issues that are getting these boats out to this out to sea on a, in a timely fashion and ultimately are going to be answering the call both as we're doing these informal and formal inspections where people are noting that our crew performance is higher on these diverse arrays of crews but ultimately when we get out to fight the fight and win that fight all right i, I don't think uh we could top that that was a great closing statement this has uh, really been a great conversation so we're out of time. My guests today have been Lieutenant Commanders Emma McCarthy and Andrea Howard, two outstanding Navy submarine officers and proceedings authors. Their article, Different But Equal, appears in the October issue of Proceedings. Thanks very much, you two. Thanks, Dale. Thank really appreciate it. All right. This episode was brought to you by Blue Cross Blue Shield. It's true what they say. A good smile is irresistible. In fact, I can't help myself from smiling right now. That's because I have Blue Cross Blue Shield FEP Dental. I pay no deductible for in-network services like fillings and root canals. Plus, my in-network preventive care is fully covered, including three cleanings a year. See what we can do for you at bcbsfepdental.com. And until next week, remember, victory begins at the Naval Institute.